afternoon, dear friends. I'm, ha I'm Jaime Adam Bloom, and it's a pleasure for the Hudson Institute to welcome you to our conference today on Venezuela. The topic will be the widespread hunger in Venezuela today. And the speaker is Professor Gustavo Coronel, founding member of the Board of Directors of Venezuela, PDVSA, and a former member of the Venezuelan Congress. Aside, he's a scholar and indeed a gentleman. We can find a newspaper worldwide the pictures of empty markets in Caracas and elsewhere in Venezuela. Consequently, non-government plain people like us must seek ways to obtain the daily food for their families. It has, it's a heartbreaking story. Just to imagine what the anguished mothers, parents, and even children feel in their difficult quest for food. Of course, there are probably thousands of people desperate to put food on the table, anguished to survive. This torture, and I have no other way to describe it, is the topic of today's presentation by our esteemed friend, Gustavo Coronel. His very impressive bio appears in the invitations and the hand programs that we distributed. I fully share the anguish of our Venezuelan brothers and sisters. However, it's not unique because the manipulation of food is a distinctive weapon of despots, dictators, and other malfeasance agents of dictators and despots that crowd the history of Latin America. Call it communist, neo-Nazis, or neo-fascist, or strongman, it doesn't matter. The fact is that today in Venezuela, there is a dictatorship that's murdering its own people. And this is the essence of present Venezuela. No doubt our speaker today is the most qualified to present it. Please take note that there will be an ample period for questions after the lecture. Our thanks to Dr. John Walters for his backing of our series of lectures. And we also thank our new director of public events, Sean Kelly, for making possible today's conference. And without any further ado, I turn the podium to Professor Gustavo Coronel. Thank you, Jaime. Well, good morning, everyone. Can, can you hear me well? Yes. Thank you. Let me see how this works. OK. The title of my uh, talk is Food uh, as a Political Tool and uh, the Case for Intervention in Venezuela. Uh, intervention sounds like a bad word in Latin America. So let's call it the case for liberation in Venezuela. Uh, this morning, I was reading the internet uh, looking for last minute news on Venezuela. And I only found that uh, President Maduro is uh, giving, giving a, a, something called uh, a carnival bonus to Venezuelans, a carnival bono, uh, bonus to keep everybody happy is uh, seven dollars to every Venezuelan. Of course, the money for these bonuses come out of print of the printing made by the Venezuelan Central Bank. And uh, as you can 
uh, surmise, this uh, uh, generates uh, the inflation that we have today. In Venezuela, for this year of 2018, uh, inflation is expected to be between 15,000 and 20,000 percent. In other news, uh, this time from UNICEF, which is a, an arm of the United Nations, says that uh, about 30 percent of the Venezuelan population uh, can be defined as uh, undernourished today. And the, the average weight loss uh, in Venezuela is something of the nature of 10, 12 pounds. Let me, let me start. Uh, let me start by saying that something that uh, few, uh, amazingly few people realize that Venezuela has been a Cuban colony for the last 15 years, at least for the last 15 years. Why is this? Strategic decisions in Venezuela are taken essentially in Havana. About 40,000 Cubans are or have been in Venezuela during these years. The, the, the number fluctuates but uh, at least uh, 30, 40,000 Cubans in Venezuela, 4,000 of which or of whom are the mili military personnel. $50 billion of Venezuelan money that would have made a tremendous difference for us today uh, are in the, in the hands and pockets of, uh, the, Cuban, uh, of the Cuban government. Uh, either in the form of uh, petroleum deliveries or in cash. Uh, cabinet meetings, uh, during, especially during the time uh, uh, Chavez was ill uh, and in Havana, the cabinet meetings, Venezuelan cabinet meetings were held in, in Havana and decisions were taken there. But in, in Venezuelan law, all decisions, cabinet decisions have to be taken in in Venezuelan territory. So legally, none of those decisions were legal, and, and yet uh, they stood. Uh, so you, you can see the, the extent to which uh, Cuba has uh, taken Venezuela as, as a political, uh, has converted Venezuela into a political satellite. Not only that, but Venezuela is also a failed state. If we define a failed state in the traditional way uh, as a country that uh, has very poor governability, uh, the government in Venezuela, you, you don't really know who is in charge. Uh, it's probably, most probably, the army. But, uh, but there is uh, an internal, uh, continuous internal uh, fight for power in Venezuela today. It's a country which is financially bankrupt, uh, in, in a continuous uh, state of uh, almost default. Uh, in fact, uh, in technical default. Venezuela has been defined as being in technical default uh, by several of these financial expert financial companies dealing with this type of thing. There is a collapse of basic services in Venezuela electricity, the water uh, availability, roads, uh, the infrastructure in Venezuela has essentially collapsed in the last uh, few years. The institutions in Venezuela are illegal. You take the Supreme Court, the Electoral Council, uh, the new National Assembly in parallel with the real National Assembly, they are all illegal. So we have uh, uh, no uh, in independent institutions, uh, no checks and balances, uh, no transparency in, in the day-to-day in -day governability. A hundred members, or almost 100 members of the government are now sanctioned by the US or Canada or the European Union. I mean, sanction 
as uh, violators of human rights, some, some as uh, co accomplices of uh, drug trafficking, uh, as money launderers, I mean, of all these uh, crimes you can, you can imagine. So uh, there is, I don't believe there is any country in the world where the whole elite, the, the top 100 uh, members of, of the government elite are sanctioned uh, with no, no, name and, and I mean, nombre y apellido by, by uh, countries such as this one and Canada and the European Union. So, and finally, uh, looting. Uh, looting is going on in Venezuela at a, an exponential rate today. Not only public markets and businesses are being looted, but also private homes. Uh, in the last three, four months, the increase in this uh, looting or ransacking has been uh, very significant. In addition to all of that, hunger uh, has been adopted as a political, as a tool for political domination in Venezuela. Uh, in the last uh, three or four years, this has been increasingly the case. Uh, and uh, I, I must start by saying that the FAO, I don't know if you know what the, FAO, what the Food and Agricultural Administration of the United Nations, uh, has been a main accomplice of the Venezuelan government in this respect. The, Venez the, the FAO, the FAO representative in Venezuela, is almost a member of the Venezuelan cabinet in the way uh, he uh, complements whatever efforts are being made in Venezuela in the way of feeding the, the population. They say everything is fine. And I have written several letters to the main headquarters of the FAO in Italy. And I, I, of course, I never got a reply. And uh, nothing has changed. Uh, the Mr. Resendez, Marcelo Resendez, who is the representative of FAO in Caracas, still is uh, uh, paying compliment to, to the efforts of the Venezuelan government as far as feeding is concerned. Now, the system now prevailing in Venezuela has been based on, uh, well, historically, they resembles in small uh, model uh, the, uh, what happened in Nazi Germany uh, that uh, took away the food from Soviet, the Soviet Union and to, to feed their armies and, and condemn uh, the Soviet Union citizens to starvation in the Stalin, uh, in, in the in, uh, Hitler era. And then in the Stalin era, it resembles the, uh, the, the, what happened in Ukraine. But of course, what happened in Ukraine was in, in much lar larger uh, scale. But in Latin America, it's based on the Cuban model of rationing and on the Chilean model as adopted by uh, Allende, who created something called uh, the Junta de Abastecimiento y Control de Precios. That was a way in which they could control the distribution of food to their own people, politically uh, friendly uh, people. In Venezuela, uh, at least uh, since 2016, uh, it has been done through the so-called uh, Comité Local de Abastecimiento y Producción, which is CLAP, uh, that unfortunately translates uh, in a very non-romantic way as the CLAP. <laughs> Now, this CLAP is a system essentially uh, originated in, in, in the military, uh, in the group military uh, institutions created by Chavez in 2000. In 2000. Uh, the Bolivar 2000 and the Fondo Único Social in Venezuela were run by the military 
and uh, they were given something of the order of uh, 400 or 500 million dollars uh, to act uh, as food distributors, as socially involved military in Venezuela. The concept was not bad. The execution was terrible. The, these programs, uh, at least uh, half of that money, say 250 million, went unaccounted for. Uh, the main uh, two persons running this were Victor Cruz uh, Weber, Weffer, Victor Cruz Weffer, and William Fariñas. They, they are both living uh, unmolested in Venezuela after all this uh, disaster they created in 2002 and 2003. But later on, in 2016, they created the Minister of Food. And the minister, they have had six ministers of food in Venezuela since then. They have all been generals of the army. Uh, I think the last one has been a, a, an admiral, an almirante. And even in more detailed form, every food item has been assigned to a general of the army. So in Venezuela, we have had uh, the, the general beans, uh, general, uh, general arroz, el general leche, el general carne. Uh, it, it sounds ridiculous, but uh, it, is, it is a fact. And they are responsible for the distribution of that particular item in, in the country. Now, the system originated also as a very efficient money laundering uh, mechanism. You see, because the, the company, it, it works like this. The, there, there is a company that in, buys this food uh, in Mexico, mostly, and imports this food into Venezuela. And the food uh, imported to this importer which happens to be the in-between of the vice president of Venezuela, of Tarek El Aysami, who is the vice president of Venezuela. He's uh, in-between called Samarc Lopez Bello, has the company in the Bahamas, I believe, importing this food from Veracruz, Mexico. That's why they call it the Mexican Club. And each box of food costs about $20 in Mexico to be imported. And they receive, this company receives about $50 per box in, put in Venezuela. So they, they pocket about uh, $20, $25 per box or per bag of food. I made a rapid calculation back of the envelope uh, that about five million boxes per, per month, and uh, that means something of the nature of one hundred million dollars per month to be distributed among the businessmen who run this uh, operation, <laughs> controlled again by the vice president of the country. The manner of operation, well, they. Uh, uh, they have a main coordinator who is a civilian called Freddy Bernal. Freddy Bernal, by the way, was caught by the Venezuelan police in 1997, Robin Banks. Uh, but he is now the coordinator of this system. And the, the operational staff for the, for the uh, CLAP, for, for, for the food bag, is run ex exclusively by the government party. Uh, the Partido Social Unificado Venezolano, and by the so-called Women's Socialist Union. They are the only ones doing the work of distributing this, this good, uh, these food bags. And uh, what they do is that they divide the areas where the food is distributed, they divide it into what they call the productive zones and the non-productive zone. And the productive zone is one in which they have won the elections before. And the non-productive zones are the ones that, where they have been defeated in, the, in past elections. So the areas where the opposition is a majority, they don't get it or they get it 
incomplete or they get it very late. And not always, again, with the same components as the ones that are delivered to the productive zones. The houses of the opposition or the buildings are marked, uh, I think uh, I have read, with a circle. The ones that have a circle, you, you don't, they don't get any food. And uh, the, the, the delivery is done every, what, every 30 or 45 days. And the contents of the boxes are always a little surprise. Uh, surprise. I mean, you never know what you're going to get. Certainly not uh, meat, uh, rarely milk, and many times things which are nice to have, but who are, which are not very nourishing, like uh, uh, toothpaste or shampoo. Now, when you start forcing the delivery of these boxes or bags as the only alternative, as the only game in town, because in parallel, you are forcing the private markets to close down, as they are doing it right now, by forcing them to sell below their actual uh, production costs. Uh, so they are creating a system which is dominated by exclusion and by monopoly. They exclude the people they don't like, and they monopolize the activity of distributing food in Venezuela. So when you have these two components going in parallel, uh, and in addition to this, you say, well, this system is being done by us as a tool of the revolution. Only the ones who follow us will reap the benefits of this system. When you have this combination uh, of things going on, then what you have, in, in my opinion, is a genocidal system. Uh, genocide genocide uh, de defined as the, the attempt to eliminate a whole group of people on the basis of religion or, 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 or on the basis of political ideology or whatever. But what is going on in Venezuela today is a, is a genocide, uh, irrespective of, of the quantitative significance of what is going on. Uh, I, I am not sure if genocide applies to uh, a few millions, but certainly this is what is going on in, in Venezuela today. A, a combination of things which uh, are driving the Venezuelan population into, into, a, a, into a generation, a current generation of undernourished adults and children with the consequences for the future that you can imagine. Uh, The impact of the system of the Venezuelan, on the Venezuelan population so far is about 70% of the homes report they, they have never received the boxes. Even, even the ones who are loyal to the revolution sometimes do, will not receive the boxes because of lack of efficiency in the distribution system. Caritas and UNICEF say that uh, about one third of the Venezuelan children today are showing signs of malnutrition. And uh, since people are coerced to obtain uh, the regime identification to receive this food, then we are dealing with a, with a crime, with a real crime going on. Uh, Caritas, which is a, a Catholic uh, organization dealing with food in, in all over the world, they say that uh, in Venezuela, the mortality of children before being one year old has tripled in the last uh, seven or, or eight years. So what we are having is a, this new generation of underdeveloped Venezuelans. And uh, I, I don't say that we used to be a country of geniuses, uh, but uh, now we are s sadly confronted with the possibility that we will have a country in the future, in the future 20 years, we will have a country with a very low level of uh, physical and mental 
uh, capability. And uh, this in itself is probably the biggest crime being committed today. Not only the sacrifice of the living Venezuelans, of the living adults, but of the future generations of, of Venezuelans. At this time in Venezuela, the, the, the doctors working in government hospitals are being prohibited from diagnosing malnutrition as such. Uh, they cannot mention the word malnutrition uh, for a patient that comes in with evident signs of being under, undernourished. So this is uh, in, in a rough uh, manner what is going on in related to, to, to this system, uh, the, the CLAP. Now, this is a, a conscious government strategy. This is not out of ineptitude. Uh, it, the results would be the same, but if, if they were simply inept, you would say, well, they, they don't know any better. But th this is being done as a conscious strategy to dominate politically the, pop the Venezuelan population and to force them into paying loyal, uh, loyalty to, to, to the regime, to the, to the Venezuelan regime. They want to stay in power indefinitely, but while the population is being materially and spiritually impoverished and uh, becomes unable, unable to free itself. And, and in my opinion, this is exactly what we are witnessing today. I believe that in Venezuela, we no longer have the internal dynamics to rebel. I think Venezuela has lost uh, the capacity to rebel, to say, stop, we don't accept it anymore. But in my, is I hope I am wrong. But uh, from everything that I have seen in the last years, Venezuela has been going down an incline in which uh, today they are practically in a state of in the in defension. Uh, politically, uh, materially, and spiritually. Spiritually being the, the worst part of it. Uh, we have lost uh, the, the desire to, 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 be, to get rid of, this, of these people. So uh, I, I have to conclude that uh, we need outside help. Uh, we cannot do it alone any longer. I, I, for a while, I thought we could, but at this moment in time, I very much doubt it. And what is happening today, I'll talk to you briefly about that in, in a minute, uh, confirms my, my worst expectations that Venezuela is now in urgent need of uh, outside help. Right now, Individual sanctions that you, you're familiar with are being very helpful. I mean, the Venezuelan government has been really put in problems by the, this combination of individual sanctions, confiscation of their wealth abroad, and, uh, and, and, the, and the moral, the moral uh, punishment that it entails to be marked as a criminal by, by, the, the con by, by the countries all over the world. So uh, the, the three main groups uh, acting today against uh, the, the Venezuelan regime are the, the, Lima, uh, the Lima group, in which uh, 12 countries in Latin America have been meeting, uh, getting together, but so far in a mostly uh, declarative way. They, they haven't taken real action they have been saying we are very concerned, we are very preoccupied, uh, this is a very sad situation, but that's as far as they have gone so far. And then you have the United States, which has been much more proactive than the Lima group. Uh, in the United States, there are maybe 75 of these top el government elites which are, who are now sanctioned with names. 
and they cannot enter the United States, and the, their uh, assets here have been touched. I don't know exactly in what way, but uh, they have. The European Union is starting to, to react. They, they, have a, a, they have a list now of sanctioned individuals. The same with Can Canada. Actually, Canada is a member of the, of the Lima Group. Uh, and then a factor that I feel is extremely important, but so far has also been in the, uh, in, in, in the background, in the shadows, so to speak, and that's Pope uh, Francisco. Uh, pope Francis, not only the Pope, but also a Latin American, and uh, in my opinion, he should have uh, adopted a much more active role in, in the Venezuelan problem, and so far he has been very silent, which is not the case, by the way, with the Venezuelan Catholic Church, which today is probably the main proactive organization in Venezuela fighting the Venezuelan uh, dictatorship. Recently, the Venezuelan regime has done a few more things to uh, reaffirm their totalitarian nature. They, they have called for elections to be, take, uh, to, to, to be taken place in April of this year. Uh, this is uh, illegal, but this is also uh, trying to manipulate these elections because in, in two more months, the Venezuelan opposition will never be able to get their act together in order to present uh, a unified candidate. And uh, the, the, the government knows this, and probably well, the Cuban advisors know that very well. So they, they are calling for these uh, elecciones adelantadas. They have uh, assassinated in cold blood a man, Oscar Perez, who was a rebel, yes, who never killed anyone in being a rebel. He went for high uh, profile actions like uh, stealing a helicopter and overflying the Venezuelan legislative uh, building and so on and so forth. He didn't kill anyone. But then he was identified, the, the, his location was identified by, by the government. The government proceeded to attack together with the armed talks, uh, the called colectivos, who are a bunch of thieves, and uh, and they both went in and they, call, uh, they killed this man and his followers, seven or eight other persons, in cold blood. They, have all, they were all executed. They are attacking the Catholic Church, the bishops. Uh, there is uh, the Bishop of Barquisimeto gave a very strong speech against the government and, the, uh, and Maduro uh, said uh, he, he will put him in, in prison. And of course, there is a dialogue going on in Dominican Republic, which is one of the saddest uh, things you can imagine, uh, uh, around a table facilitated by a mercenary called uh, Jose Luis Rodriguez Zapatero, who was former pre uh, prime minister of Spain, and uh, facilitated also by the president of the Dominican Republic, Danilo Medina, who is uh, very identifiable with the Venezuelan regime. And th these men are sitting with a group that, in my opinion, does no longer represent the Venezuelan population. This is a group of politicians who are very pragmatic in the sense that uh, pragmatism is for them uh, much better than uh, sticking to principles and values, and they are sort of prepared to give this regime, uh, give them benefits that the regime should not receive. Uh, most probably, some sort of agreement will be reached in which uh, they are guaranteed, the, the members of the regime are guaranteed their personal uh, freedom and guarantees that their money ill obtained will not be touched, and that sort of thing. But uh, th this is uh, what is going on there. As you can see, uh, 
this combination of uh, being a Cuban colony, being a failed state, uh, uh, being under attack of a genocidal regime, calls, in, in my opinion, for outside intervention. Now, outside intervention, intervention, as I said before, has been always a bad word in Latin America, and with certain amount of reason. Uh, the, the years of uh, U.S. unilateral intervention in Latin America have been the basis for this uh, uh, reaction, instinctive reaction against the term intervention uh, in Latin America. But of course, within the OAS, you, not only you have interve non-intervention as one of the pillars, but you have another pillar called the Democratic Inter-American Charter which obligates, which uh, forces the, uh, Latin American countries to intervene, is the only word that can be used, to intervene in a country where democracy is in imminent danger of being eliminated. Now you have levels of intervention, and as I said before, these 100 individual, individual sanctions are doing a very good job of softening the Venezuelan regime. And there have been some economic, so far shy economic sanctions, like uh, limiting the financial transactions of the Venezuelan regime in the US and, and so forth. There is a weapons embargo in, in implemented by some of the European countries on Venezuela. But so far, there has not been, they haven't gone beyond that. So we, we, we can have, we could have more severe economic sanctions. We could have, I, and I don't know, I am not an expert on this. Uh, I am sure that jo, uh, John uh, Ambassador Maisto could uh, provide us with a better assessment of, of whether the European Union and, and the Lima Group could uh, simply say, we do not recognize the Maduro government any longer on the basis of, of all of these crimes. I don't know whether this is possible. But if nothing of this type works, if nothing works, I, I would not hesitate in accepting the possibility of a military, multilat multilateral military intervention in Venezuela. And I wouldn't call it intervention. I would call it liberation of Venezuela. Uh, we tend to forget that we Venezuelans, way back in time, intervene act actively in Latin America. Bo Bolivar went on from, he from Venezuela to Colombia and to Ecuador and to Peru and to Bolivia and intervened these countries militarily in order to obtain their independence. And uh, in those first years, all of the presidents of these countries the president of Ecuador, Juan José Flores, the president of Colombia, Rafael Urdaneta, the president of, of, of Bolivia, Antonio José de Sucre. Uh, they were, the, 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 the Peruvian dictator was Bolívar uh, in Venezuela, Paez. They were all Venezuelans. So we, uh, we are probably the, the original interventors in, in Latin America. So we shouldn't be shy now about being liberated from the Cuban invasion of Venezuela that has been on for the last 15 years. So I'll, I'll leave it here, and then uh, we can sort of get into questions and answers. Thank you. Por favor, que yo gusta. Um, there is going to be um, two members of our staff with microphones that they'll be bringing to the person that's going to ask the question. And who asked the question is determined here. <laughs> um, please raise the hands, those okay? The uh, the last on, on the left name 
an affiliation, please. I'm going to get closer to you because I'm going deaf. Uh, my name is Logan Coleman. I'm with the Department of State. You talk on the one hand about the Lima Group being too passive as it currently stands and finished with the idea of a multilateral intervention. Obviously, those two currently exist on two different ends of a spectrum. What kind of steps can we take right now to get other countries in the region more vocal about the humanitarian situation in Venezuela? Well, as I, as I put it in one of the slides, I think intervention would go progress by degrees. Uh, so far, we have had individual sanctions, which are so far excellent. But we also could have economic sanctions, because of the, the Venezuelan regime is spending from a very thin thread financially. I mean, they, they have no, way, no, no place to go. It, it could be enough, for example, for the U.S. to simply to stop importing the Venezuelan oil, which is being imported today. Uh, that's only 600,000 barrels a day. It used to be 1.4 million barrels a day years ago, but now it's, it's less than half. And the U.S. does not need that oil any longer. Uh, Venezuela, uh, the U.S. has, in fact, exporting oil to Venezuela right now. Uh, about 80,000 barrels of oil, of gasoline, are going in the average to Venezuela from the United States because the Venezuelan refineries are collapsing due to lack of maintenance. If that doesn't work, then this non-recognition, non, non, the diplomatic non-recognition, I believe, that would be total isolation of the Venezuelan regime in the world, if, if done by the Lima Group, by the US, by Canada, and by the European Union, I believe that uh, Maduro, uh, or the regime, because it's not only Maduro, it's not even the worst of the, of the lot, uh, they wouldn't survive that. So I, I believe we don't really need to get to the military part in order to get rid of this uh, Venezuelan regime. OK, the gentleman here, please give us your name on affiliation. Yes, um, Per Kurovsky, just a Venezuelan. Um, we have a situation of hunger. People are dying right now. People are fleeing our country in masses. There's a lack of medicine. There's an urgency in it all. An urgency that starts to preclude or exclude completely some solutions. Because frankly, trying to mount a reasonably democratic election will take us at least 10 months. We'll get to November, December. And just to sit back and think about how many will suffer in that period is is hard to do. And also a little bit the same with the oil. If we cut off the oil revenues that the government has, whatever, the hunger will be explode dramatically. So if that happens, it has to come immediate actions thereafter, or one way or another, because this is, this is, this is not only a political crisis now. Now it's a humanitarian crisis. I do think that we could rapidly expand the sanctions to individual, if we multiply it by 100,000 sanctions against any military that is seen in the street violating human rights. And there is facial recognition for that. And that would immediately put 100,000 wives of the military, put pressure on the military like no one can think. If those military are not allowed, there, the children, to go to Canada, to US, to Europe, to Argentina, to Chile, to Peru, they're going to get scared, real scared. Thank you. Yes, uh, I, I think I have, uh, I, I, I forgot the humanitarian part uh, by getting too enthusiastic on the political and economic sanctions. In parallel with these political and economic sanctions, we have to create uh, immediately a, a, a channel for humanitarian aid into Venezuela 
And I believe that the United Nations has already, through UNICEF, given us the basis for that. UNICEF is saying Venezuelans are dying of hunger. Uh, so if the, U if the United Nations is saying this, and uh, it should follow through by doing something about it. Uh, this could be coordinated by the Red Cross, uh, by Caritas. Uh, I mean, there should be a politically pressured, yes, but it should be a, a, a very urgent action taken uh, along those lines. I don't see any questions here in the lab. Yes, sir. Angel Gonzalez, private citizen, Venezuelan. Um, what do you think is the cost, and who would have to incur the cost, of an outright liberation of Venezuela? The cost, you mean in dollars? Dollars, euros. <laughs> well, frankly, that's something I have not uh, considered. Uh, uh, all I could say about dollars is that uh, uh, the members of the Venezuelan regime have about $600 billion outside Venezuela, and that money should somehow be rescued from, from their pockets. I know that one thing is not the same as, as the other, but uh, uh, I, I don't know, frankly. Uh, the United Nations, they don't have the money. It should, it should have to be, the money should have to be provided by by the European Union and by the US and Canada, a joint effort along those lines. That's the, that's the only thing I can imagine because Latin America will not have the, the resources for, for that, I, I am afraid. No, my concern is that there has to be an economic argument over the moral case that you've presented very eloquently. So my concern is um, the price of oil Right, is in a trading range where it's, it's, it's fine, 60 to $80, WTI. However, if we start increasing production in Venezuela to a nation that's actually a net exporter of energy like the United States, that creates a surplus. So it takes us out of the trading range. I'm, my concern is that there's an economic argument to not intervene in Venezuela. You mean by, because you say that uh, the oil is going to be increased, the production? No, because of oil production increase, correct. Well, the thing is that in Venezuela, oil production cannot increase. The, the, Venezuelan, oil, uh, the Venezuelan oil industry has collapsed. They, they don't have uh, management. They don't have uh, financial capability. They, they don't have technical capability. They are in total disarray. Uh, right now, Venezuela is producing about 1.9 or maybe 1.8 million barrels per day, which is almost 1 million barrels per day less than five years ago. And, uh, and they cannot recover from that. Uh, we, we won't be able to, to get back to 3 million barrels in, for the next uh, 20, uh, 10 or, or, or 12 years. So. That is no, that's, that is no alternative. Uh, the gentleman here, the left. Uh, my name is Reinaldo Rojas. I am a Venezuelan arts and culture promoter. Uh, with all this uh, uh, setting the facts so clearly for us, I only imagine that in Venezuela there are much interest, not only Cubans, there are Russians interest, there are Chinese interest, Iranian in interest, and through in Iran, Hezbollah is in Venezuela. <clears throat> so what I think with all this is that is not only the Venezuelan regime, and for any intervention, of a military humanitarian force, there would be a response, a global response, because of those interests in Venezuela. So I, I'm thinking about Venezuela being transformed in the next Syria 
of South America. What do you think about it? Well, uh, I am a geologist. <laughs> nothing, nothing much about uh, foreign policy or diplomacy or so. But, but I, I have a feeling that uh, China or, the, or Russia are not going to put their head on a, uh, for Venezuela. Uh, the, the priorities of China, for example, th seem to be much more aligned with the priorities of the United States. They have most of their money invested here. Uh, they cannot afford uh, to fight uh, to the death with the United States over, or with Mr. Trump, over Venezuela. Uh, so I, I instinctively, I, I don't believe China will jump. Uh, the, all they need is to keep their presence in Latin America, and if possible, to recover the money they have given to the government. They have given to Maduro and Chavez about $75 billion dollars and uh, some of that money is, is probably lost forever. That's uh, China. Russia, uh, even less so, I think. Uh, but uh, I, I hope some other in the audience will clarify this for us a little more. Uh, and Hezbollah, uh, yeah, Hezbollah is what it is. It's a, it's a terrorist uh, group with a limited amount of uh, foreign capability. They, they, what, what could they do to us? You know? uh, so I, I don't believe uh, they will, there, there will be a, a group of world uh, powers siding with this agonizing regime. I don't believe so. We go now to the right. The gentleman in the uh, yellow we are still tie. <laughs> uh, Jacob Luzzi for Voice of America. And uh, you said uh, two serious accusations. One about the FAO, its uh, accomplice of the Venezuelan regime, and also that is happening a genocide in uh, Venezuela. So I want if you can explain the, these accusations, because they are pretty serious. Yes. You mean default? Hmm? Did you say default? No. You, I said about, you said that what's happening in Venezuela is yeah. a genocide. Yes. Genocide is a strong okay. Okay. word. And also, the FAO, if you ah, the FAO. The FAO uh -huh. is a complice uh -huh. of. Oh, yeah. China. Yeah, that's very, as you say, that's a very, uh, very severe accusation. But uh, the thing is that uh, I have the facts about it. Uh, and, and I have put them in writing to the headquarters <laughs> of the FAO in Rome, and I have never got a reply. There is a gentleman there who has been the representative in Caracas of FAO called Marcelo Resendes. He's a Brazilian. Uh, I, I, I cannot be, make sure that he's still there, but he was. He has been there for years, and uh, he practically became a member of the cabinet, as I said, in the sense that uh, he has, he attended uh, cabinet meetings. He went the, to the press and said, uh, "Venezuela is a wonderful example of uh, responsibility to the citizens of Venezuela by feeding them." Uh, the CLAP uh, is a wonderful system, a very creative system, uh, without a, ever mentioning the fact that it was also a political tool. Uh, I wrote to Mr. Resendez, and of course I never got a reply from Mr. Resendez. Uh, you can find the, the letters in my blog, or I'll send, it, I'll send them to you uh, in my blog, because sometimes I cannot even find anything in my blog. Uh, <laughs> I have written 6,200 articles in my blog, and I forgot to make an index. So I don't, now I have to rely on memory. When did I say this, you know? But, uh, but, but if I Google that and I said, uh, uh, FAO is a criminal agency in Venezuela, Gustavo, Gustavo Coronel says that, 
you will hit it. <laughs> but now that's, that's foul. And the other one is? Oh, genocide. Well, as I said before, I don't know whether what is going on in Venezuela uh, aligns with the precise definition of genocide. But if you have a population being subject to exclusion from access to food because you are not ideologically friendly to the government, and when they know it, they refrain from selling you the subsidized food. And at the same time, you cannot go to the open private markets because they are being closed down systematically. Then you're, coming, you're being put into a, what you call a funnel that gets narrower and narrower all the time. And the end result is genocide, is the extinction of, of a good portion of the Venezuelan society, which is not aligned with the government. And I, I call that a genocide. So I, I don't know. I, I am ready to call it something else if the, my meaning stays <laughs> the same, you know? Because it, because it also goes into something which is like a horror movie. It goes into the creation of a future Venezuela of very feeble population, mentally, even more so than today. And uh, also physically. We have, we, we, have, we have been pretty good athletes. So we, we, have, uh, we had Galarraga and we had uh, uh, Miguel Cabrera and so on and so forth, very good boxers. But uh, what, what I mean to say is now, this is being put in jeopardy, the, the capability of, of a society to develop in, in the way it should be developed. Yes, sir. My name is not very Venezuelan, it's Vladimir Yakovlev. And don't confuse me with Vladimir Putin, please. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to add some data, if you allow me, Gustavo. Uh, first of all, I, I doubt that many people here know. Uh, Venezuelan army today has 2,000 generals. 2,000 generals. That's more than all the countries of NATO. Uh, and that is simply to get their favor. Because a general, they have a new car, they have access to all kinds of things and so on, and that is part of what the government uses to have the army on their side. That's one, one data. Secondly, uh, last week, the International Monetary Fund put out their uh, projection for inflation for Venezuela for this year. We're now in 2018. It is 13,000%. I'm being an engineer, but I don't conceive what is 13,000%. It's so big that I don't know. That, that is horrible. Mm. So that's the second uh, a area. Thirdly, uh, um, Gustavo didn't mention, but uh, several already at least maybe eight or 10 years ago, Venezuela changed all the books of primary and secondary education. That means that the young people are getting fed something which is not true. I'll give you one example. I, unfortunately, in the move to Washington, here at Washington area, I lost that. I used to have the book for the real first kindergarten. It was about 25 pages. And the first page said, yes, uh, Simon Bolivar is the liberator of Venezuela. But he didn't do much. Really the liberator is, is uh, Chavez. Well, that is a, a, a total change of history. And that's what the young kids, now they're 18 years old. So 18 or 19. So they're in the university, and that's what they learn from, from, from very young. To change that is not easy. It's very hard. And finally, one last comment is that uh, uh, the, the, uh, aside from the book chain, and they change all the books, in, in, at least in primary and secondary education. The situation in Venezuela now is in the university, which is what I know, uh, is 
people are leaving in droves looking to go, where to go because the salary doesn't, uh, uh, let's say, is not enough for them to buy the normal living conditions. And uh, uh, Mr. Maduro, by the way, if you know, is a bus driver, but he became president. So I think that's a very s simple distinction of Venezuela. Having a bus driver as president is very important. <laughs> uh, and uh, Mr. Maduro just declared, because it's coming up very soon, for the carnival, which is right before the uh, Easter Lent, uh, a, a, an additional, uh, let's say, a, a special uh, gift for all the people, may, mainly the, those that are working, of 700,000 bolivars. Uh, yeah, seven dollars. Seven dollars. Well, it's seven dollars. Okay, but 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 that seven hundred sounds like a very big number. <laughs> so that is to to give, uh, let's say, to keep quiet people and so on. So I think uh, what Gustavo said is a, is a very. And finally, I'd like to make a comment. But going back thirty years, and mostly I'm addressing the lady from the uh, uh, State Department. Unfortunately, uh, in the eighties talking 30, 20 some years back, uh, uh, everybody was happy with the OAS because there were programs in science, in technology, in education, etc., cetera, that, that countries felt that they were getting at something. Unfortunately, the Secretary General that came in at the end of the 80s eliminated all, he said, no, OAS should be only political. Well, people lost interest. Now they don't get anything from the OAS. Mm -hmm. So uh, it is harder, and Venezuela, as, as uh, Gustavo said very well, has uh, used this very well by giving out oil, by getting other things to the C Caribbean countries. So now it has tied up 14 boats, definitely, in the OAS. Yes. So this is the condition. Um. There was a gentleman over there that raised the... Okay, right. But, but uh, Jaime, he... Yes. yes, I just wanted to bring something up. Uh, the hunger itself and what economical things have done in Venezuela. 2012, I wrote an op-ed in the El Universal in Caracas, which where I wrote every week, every week for 10 years before I was censored. Uh, that was titled 2,190 Millions of Hunger Nights. That was a title in 2012, in which I indicated that by just doing some little changes in the economy within, these nights could be eliminated. Now, last month, I recalculated, and I saw that only by putting the Venezuelan gasoline price at its international level, you could, by reducing internal consumption and by reducing smuggling, you could feed well 6 million Venezuelans, 20% of its population. I think that this type of misbehavior, in econ economical misbehavior, should also be classified as violations against human rights. And OAS has that in a small little piece in Chile that they put it out, but it's been never used. Never has someone really gone after what must be economic crimes against humanity. This gasoline price in Venezuela is right now economic crime against humanity. Thank you. Thank you, Gustavo. Nice to see you. Very good uh, presentation. Well, my name is uh, David Smolansky. I'm a mayor in exile. I was removed from office uh, six months uh, ago. I uh, had a warrant of arrest. And, uh, well, been here in the United States since uh, last uh, October. Um, I have to say that I agree that uh, uh, Grupo de Lima could do more. 
I think it's a very good initiative in Latin America because for many years Venezuelans were uh, like feeling alone or isolated by the region. They have been uh, uh, that initiative. I think it's 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 uh, was really good last uh, year. I think uh, what they said last uh, week was uh, really important regarding the elections. But uh, probably uh, they have to start discussing uh, doing sanctions in Latin America uh, the same way that the European Union, United States, and Canada has done. Because uh, many of the properties and many of the bank accounts of the high officials and their families are in Latin American countries. So if, if they, for example, prohibited uh, high officials to travel around Latin America and the Caribbean, there will be uh, more pressure, especially in a year that there are elections in Colombia, Brazil, and, and Mexico. I have to say that I am a bit disagree that uh, Venezuelans have lost uh, spirit. Um, I was removed because I was on the streets protesting for 120 days, nonviolent protests. Uh, I don't have arms. I think that the problem in Venezuela is that we have an army that is a political party with arms and weapons. Um, and uh, we tried everything on the streets, everything. I mean, as a mayor, with the main cemetery in Caracas, uh, in, in my municipality in El Atillo, I had to bury no less than seven people that out of the 130 that were uh, killed. Uh, and the thing is that in Venezuela is living something that is unique in our history and probably is unique in Latin America. That is a narco petro state run by military. So we are talking on a re regime that runs the, the legal uh, business, the, the biggest legal business in the world that is oil and also the biggest illegal business in the world that is drug trafficking linked with uh, contrabando, sorry about my English, and uh, money laundry. So I think that Venezuela right now is the biggest uh, crisis the Western Hemisphere has, and I quite agree that is uh, that we're going to, I mean, it, it, it could have some comparison with, with Syria. I mean, many people talk about Syria that uh, around four and five million Syrians have fled the country. Well, two million and a half Venezuelans have fled the country, and in Syria it's approximately uh, 300,000 people have been killed since 2011, been in a war in Venezuela because of crime. It is estimated that almost 300,000 Venezuelans uh, have been uh, killed. So definitely, uh, I think uh, to, to take more attention about international communities that we have to see the regime as a threat to the region. The Maduro's regime is not only a threat to Venezuelans, it is a threat to the region. It's not a threat to 30 million Venezuelans. It is a threat to hundreds of millions of uh, Latin Americans. And uh, with these conditions that are presented right now, there's no way that we can go to elections. I mean, that will be one of the silliest decisions that could have ever been made. I mean, we, we cannot go to election. And I could say here that I have been in touch with uh, some political leaders in Venezuela. My proposal is that we have to do the same as we did last year on the 16 de Julio and, and do that as a presidential election that has to be sworn by the National Assembly and has to be recognized by an international uh, community. Doing that clash of powers is the only way, I think, with the international uh, community uh, also pressuring that could uh, create a change. But at the end of the day, we need that the army need to break uh, because the problem is that uh, what, Maduro, uh, what Maduro still has and, and the key that Maduro is in power is because he has uh, the arms, and with that, he repressed and he killed. So, sorry if I took longer. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, thank you, David. David. Perdón. Quieres comentar? Sí. Well, briefly. No, I I agree with you. The problem is that in Venezuela, and that's uh, what I called uh, the failed state situation. Uh, the army is in government. They they are the ones calling the the shots. And Maduro is, uh, is a stooge of the, of the armed forces. That, that's a problem. And the, the armed forces have gone into the, the, the best businesses in Venezuela. They, they run PDVSA, they run the oil company today. They, they run the smuggling of gasoline and diesel into Colombia, which is a very lucrative uh, business. Uh, they they run much of the of the narco the, the, of the drug trafficking. Uh, the minister of the interior, uh, General Reverol, is one of the uh, drug traffickers. Diosdado Cabello, who is the gray eminence in the Venezuelan regime, uh, kind of Fulgencio Batista of Venezuela, is uh, is, is a drug czar. Uh, 
So uh, that's the problem in Venezuela. The, the, the whole Venezuelan nightmare could end in five minutes if the army decides to withdraw their support from the regime. But they won't do it because right now they are committed. They, they, they are up to here and uh, they will be prosecuted. And to them, it's impossible. They don't want to go to prison. So they, they stay, they hold on to power because their next step would be prison unless they can negotiate. And my problem is that part of the opposition is negotiating. Not David Smolansky, who is now here in exile. By the way, many years ago, and he doesn't remember, uh, I heard that the University of Utah had given or was given Danny Glover a prize for humanitarian this and that. And I wrote a letter to them uh, saying, be careful because Danny Glover just went to Venezuela and got $18 million from Mr. Chavez. Uh, money that he never returned or he pocketed and he never accounted for, Danny Glover. So I don't think he should be given a prize. And the president of the University of Utah sent me an invitation to go to talk in Utah. And, and I said, well, the only way I can go and talk is with a Venezuelan who knows a student. And David was one of the brightest. And then uh, he said yes, and at the last minute he couldn't make it. So I, didn't, I, I couldn't go to Utah to, to fight uh, uh, Danny Glover, fortunately. Because da Danny Glover, uh, you have seen him together with Mel Gibson. He's very good at handguns. So. Thank you. Um, my name's Sophie Hölscher. I'm German. I'm a student, private. Um, we've been talking about how to intervene, whether to intervene, but we haven't really been talking about what comes after intervention. And in my opinion, before you intervene, you should know what you're going to do afterwards, because there's been quite a lot of interventions that didn't really bring anything better than before. Um, so what's your plan? And um, I mean, we've heard that... Um, part of the Venezuelan population is not very well educated or even maybe wrongly educated. So do you think it's even like possible to have a sudden change that leads to something better than what we have now? By all means, <clears throat> by all means. I myself, I don't have a plan. At almost 85, you don't have plans. But uh, people like David will have plans. Uh, there is a very bright, young generation of Venezuelans here and there ready to take over. And uh, it's not going to the moon. You don't have to imagine. I mean, what, what you want is an honest, democratic government in place. And uh, if the intervention can lead to transparent elections, to a new government made up of this uh, young generation of Venezuelans uh, that should be honest, should be modern, because I tell you, we are full of myths and legends in Venezuela. Horrible things like uh, the oil industry is ours. Uh, we have to have control of the oil, uh, sovereignty, uh, this and that and the other, you know, this nationalistic com derived from, from complexes of inferiority that have been carried for many, many years in Venezuela, we have to get rid of those. So if we, if we can put together a, a government of, of the modern young people, and there are uh, people like David or like Leopoldo Lopez, or uh, the, uh, somebody who is no longer as young, but an Antonio Ledesma, a, a wonderful lady called Maria Corina Machado. Uh, I mean, you find them. You will find them. The, the, the raw material for a better Venezuela is already in place. All we have to do is to form a government and, uh, and, and to get rid of so much baggage, you know. 
in the way of uh, dishonesty, corruption, uh, complexes of inferiority, as I said before. From 1928, we had a, a generation in Venezuela called the 1928 generation that fed on Marxist literature and was a very powerful agent against the dictator then, Mr. Gomez. And, and this generation of 1928 has had a tremendous impact on, on Venezuelan politics for many, many years. And there are flags, main flags, where Venezuela is sovereign, uh, non-intervention, uh, control of our basic industries. Uh, this all sounded fine and dandy, but uh, it might have not have been the, the optimum way to behave. For example, well, and you could go on for hours, but concessions, oil concessions in Venezuela are probably the optimum way for Venezuela to run the oil industry. But go to Venezuela and talk about concessions, and you will be lucky to get out alive. Because concessions give you an impression of you are conceding something to a foreigner, uh, to these uh, Yankees are coming back, uh, the, the Germans are coming back, and so on and so forth. When in fact, if you, you don't have to control any industry to get optimum benefits. Uh, you don't have to have the property of this industry. All you have to do is to control it through regulations and, and honest supervision. But uh, we are in a jungle of uh, legends and myths uh, that we have to destroy in order to come up with this new Venezuela that we require. <laughs> but it's not that difficult. <laughs> yes? I just really think this can't come from outside. I think it needs to come from inside, and I agree that um, people haven't given up on this. There's been so many riots, so many protests, also like peaceful protests. And um, science says that um, when people have least to lose, um, revolution is most likely. Um, so this would be the perfect time, actually. Um, and I, as I said, I don't think an outside intervention can bring such a change um, because it won't it might change the regime but it's not going to change the myths and the system exactly and the people that do support the regime because there are after all people who support it yeah, and but, I think uh, haven't you had a car that run out of battery uh, the car stop and then you call someone who give you a push and then you go on. What you need is somebody to give you a push. I am not saying that, I am not talking about occupation in Venezuela by foreign uh, uh, countries. I am talking of intervention in Venezuela to put things back into the proper place. Uh, elections, transparency, a new government, and then you go on from there. And it's your country, and it's your destiny. Yes, but the opposition is already not not as stable and unified. Um, so after someone allows for transparent um, elections, I don't think there would be enough of an opposition to actually change things. I think maybe the outcome of an election would be the same. Well, I see that we have to talk some more about that. <laughs> but, but I think uh, he, he, he has been asking for... Hi, how are you? Uh, my name is Mateus, just a private citizen. I wanted to get an impression from you of the 30 million Venezuelans. Uh, how many of those live in rural settings? And what is the economic impact of those people who do live in these rural settings? Is there a respite to the food shortages at all? Or well, what is their economic impact? Of the, the ones who live where? In rural, rural settings. Or rural settings. Well. Venezuela is probably the most urbanized country in, in the world. I would say close to, I mean, among the first, say, five countries, maybe 90-odd some percent of the Venezuelan population is in urban centers. The, the, rural, uh, the rural environment was deserted precisely because the government simply uh, 
was indifferent. I, I, I'm not talking of this current government, which is also indifferent, but also of traditional. There was a traditional neglect of Venezuelan governments for the rural environment. And now you have, uh, instead of somebody with a two or three or 10 cows in the rural environment, you have somebody selling uh, pencils in a, in a street corner in, in the city. That has been going on for many, many years. We have in Venezuela probably an informal sector that don't pay income tax, uh, that uh, is not registered as formally employed, that is about 60 or 65 percent of the working population in, in Venezuela. The so-called buoneros are a big majority of the Venezuelan uh, getting some kind of an income. Uh, and that's a big problem. Uh, and, and, and this is not a, something that can be remedied uh, in the short term. Uh, this is a longer term problem. Uh, uh, Gustavo. Gustavo. Yes. Uh, this gentleman wants to make a... Uh... No, no, no. Yes. I heard about the plans for the future. We trust a lot, the youngs. But no country where their government, in a centralized way, can receive 97% of all export revenues is sustainable. Sooner or later, it will break down. The only way we could really use this tragedy and turn it into something really good would go for a sort of type of Alaska new plan of oil revenue sharing to all the Venezuelans and have the governments work not with oil money, but with taxes paid by citizens so that they are accountable to citizens. At this moment, they get the money from oil. We citizens are just a nuisance for it. And, Ambassador, uh, would you like to say something? Uh, no? I think <laughs> OK. But I am very happy to see you here. Yes. Duke Banks, I'm also Venezuelan-American. To add well, what Per has mentioned and to this young woman's concern from Germany, you need to go next door to Czechoslovak or the Czech Republic. 20 years ago, I had the opportunity of doing some work in the Czech Republic. And effectively, one of the reasons for the resurgence of the Czech Republic after the fall of the Iron Curtain was exactly what Per mentioned, taking basic industries and giving them in, very, in shares to the various, to the citizens. And that is one of, I think, one of the things that PDVSA and a restructuring of some type was basically every Venezuelan gets so many ac acciones or uh, stock options, probably similar to what the Czechs did. It was very good for bringing in interna international capital to create the jobs and all of that. But I think that's one of the plans, futures that the younger, that the younger generation of Venezuelans can, you know, can consider. That's my little two cents worth, or two euros worth. <laughs> <laughs> okay, two final questions. Uh, I haven't seen anyone asking questions on this side, so I'll have to abandon the right in favor of the left. <laughs> this young lady here. Hi, how are you? I'm a Venezuelan journalist, and I want to say that people haven't given up in Venezuela. And actually, after the, the protests that we have last year, four months continuous, uh, three important people of the government uh, separate from the regime, the ex-general attorney, the ex-minister of justice, and the ex-president of PDVSA. So I think that people haven't given up, and, and that's an important thing that I don't know what you, what you think. And on the last two months, on December and January, people protest because they didn't receive the the food. So my opinion is that actually the social problem in Venezuela is that the poor people, it's dominated because of the food control. So they are repressed in the most minimum ways. I, I have a close case of a friend that she lives in a poor zone in Caracas and she didn't receive the food because uh, the leader of the community saw that on Instagram she is following opposition leaders. So they, I mean they're uh, repressed in the most minimum ways. The medium class, it's also repressed. The universities, the businessmen, in the protests, we all got repressed. And the high 
part of the high class in Venezuela, it's it's uh, doing business with the government. So I think that's what's going on. Like the high high class, it's doing government with the uh, doing business with the government. The poor class, it's just by the control because of the food, and the medium class that is getting repressed, it's just leaving the country. So that's my opinion. It's one of the biggest problem, I think. Thank you. Final question. Yes, sir. Hold on a second. Microphone. Thank you, Jose Escobar, uh, private citizen. Um, Gustavo, um, you say that uh, this is, could be a liberation of the Cuban domination of Venezuela. Will you please uh, make some comments how you see the Cubans uh, in this context, uh, in case you know some kind of intervention, as you propose, is uh, taking part uh, at some, you know, at some time. So, you, uh, what, what are the Cubans uh, do in, in this? What do you think they are going to do in this uh, situation? Perhaps. Uh, yeah. Well, that's that's very that's very interesting. Actually, uh, I have no idea of how the Cubans would react. Uh, I think different to Russia and China, I, I believe that we could expect uh, some, something more from the uh, Cubans in the, in the way of p protest or resistance. But again, Cuba is in no much better situation than we are in Venezuela. In, in fact, uh, if, uh, if you take away all of these transfers still going on, not, not as much as before, but still going on to Cuba, Cuba will be in pretty difficult position uh, to survive politically and economically. Uh, and uh, things with, uh, with the U.S. are not going well uh, right now. So I, I don't believe Cuba would be, uh, they are ready, Castro is ready to go. He's uh, already with half his body outside of the presidential palace. And uh, so I, I, I don't know, I don't feel Cuba should be a factor uh, in impeding uh, a drastic change in Venezuela. Uh, they would suffer the change, but they, they cannot do very much about it. That's my feeling. But again, I, I am not really not much of an expert on that. Well, this has been a wonderful occasion. Uh, very good exchanges between our speaker and the distinguished public. So, I hope to see you next time for, all, for, for a very interesting occasion also. We thank you, and uh, let's keep in touch. Thank you.